I asked Zoe to write the foreword to this book because she's basically the only musician I've ever met that doesn't need to read this book. Um, really defines building a sustainable music career. I'm doing this for a few reasons. One, um, this is information that's out there, but I've never seen it presented in order. Um, yeah, true. Maybe like a blog here or there, but true, never but, like all in a book. Right. And yeah. so I see musicians at these conferences spending a ton of money and just like grasping at nuggets of information, like grasp, you know, trying hard. Yeah. But considering it was an industry that was set up decades ago to confuse artists, um, that would be like trying to teach a child multiplication and division before you teach them addition and subtraction. Um, mm -hmm. So, it, and also it was like, it was information I was kind of, ex I was sick of explaining to people and just felt like you shouldn't have to know me um, to have access to this. And then yeah. the revenue stream component is I was sick of taking on national acts that people have heard of and, and be finding money for them, which on one hand I know is my job, but is like kind of messed up if it's people yeah. that, you know, that people have heard of. And why I wanted you involved with this forward, like I said, is you're, in, including Amanda and Julia, you're the only musician I've ever met that doesn't need to read this book. Um, <laughs> so. That's funny. Do you feel that way? I mean, you, 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 um, know, you understand. Yeah, that. yeah I, I did read it and I was like, oh yeah, I don't need that. And I, what, I, what I did think was interesting was that um, I didn't know any of this stuff going in. <laughs> right. So um, I, I wonder, like, would it have been different if I knew? I just, I just, but I have that kind of, I realize I'm unique in that um, I have that software programmer's mentality of, oh, here's a bug. How do I fix it? Or right. what's behind this? Or, you know, I'm always, I look at the system and that's just kind of in my nature. And, and I've approached it like I would approach designing a map or debugging a piece of code or whatever. So, yeah, um, I mean, I figured it out as I went along too, although I, yeah. I can't code. Um, yeah, I think there's other, you know, nearly everybody I know who did this either figured it out on their own or they had somebody who did it for them. Um, and I think, I don't know what it would be like to start now and to know all these things. And would it be better? Like, who knows? Well, um, it's interesting you mentioned that because I was really frustrated when Taylor Swift um, made her big statement about um, not owning her masters and how upset she was. Um, and because that was that was confusing to me because on one hand, I'm like, I completely emotionally get how you feel, but that's the piece of paper you signed, one, like that's what you signed up for, literally. And two, yeah. Artists like Prince, like, warned you and many others, like, not that long ago. I worked really hard on, like, my little live show, and I also worked on my EP that I was doing. And I did it by myself in a room, and I worked on it for maybe quite some time. I can't remember how long it was, but it was, it was time until finally I felt like it was really ready. And, and I knew that this was, I had made something different that really felt, I felt proud of. I felt like it represented me as a person. Yeah. That was how, that was what I knew. It was something, it wasn't just something I thought was cool or I liked it. Not any, it really felt like this is a musical version of myself. I love it. That's, that's, that's what I knew that I was ready to get out there. However, what happened next was in my enthusiasm, I started sending it out to people I knew in the industry because I was already known as a session cellist. And then I started getting the, the rejections, which I realized now I was lucky to get. Often you don't hear anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so then I got all the rejections. And that that's a really difficult point because here you are, you have your soul encapsulated in musical form and people are telling you that it's not interesting or it doesn't have any marketability or maybe you should have vocals to that or why don't you come into my office and then I'll make a, get a picture of you lying across the... Uh, uh, for a rug and put that on the cover and that'll be great you know <laughs> which actually happened to amazing um, so um, that's that's really crushing and what do you do next because more likely than not you're going to be crushed 
by you're gonna think that somebody should hear this musical soul and they're not gonna hear what you hear because maybe yeah. if it's good this is what I think if it's good maybe it hasn't been done before mm-hmm. and people in the business only want to hear things that they already know somebody else has done right yeah um, so I think nearly all the artists I love started doing something that nobody in the industry had heard before and therefore they weren't ready to hear it yet yeah. <laughs> and so what do you do next are you gonna be are you gonna go back to your room and are you gonna be crushed or are you gonna do it yourself I thought your focus on like the email is, is crucial and it's still amazing that in 2019 people don't do that um, and they just rely on Facebook or yes. Instagram or whatever and um, it just got to all be about the email list and it's worth the money like I feel like that's the, that's the one thing I pay for the email list every month and I'm happy to pay for it. <laughs> Yeah, and the other thing we've been playing around with, and I'd be curious what your fans would think about this, is we've also been doing some text lists. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when I say email list, that's just like the bucket that it gets held Yeah. In. But I actually, I don't put an email list out anymore. I just, I tell people the number from the stage. Oh, great. You know, it's like... 444999 or something like that and, and I put posters of that in the lobby by the merch table mm-hmm. um, with the number and it's because I'm famous for putting out my email list sign up sheet and then I, th- I lose them yeah <laughs> or or I don't enter the numbers I don't right. enter the, um, the email and uh, for a while I was using TaskRabbit mm-hmm which is a good thing you know I'd, I'd like get them all together in a pile I'd scan them and I'd put it up as a job on task, task grab it and a day later you have it all done as data entry so um, that's that's the way to do it and then I just started using the text which is great <laughs> and, I, and way more people sign up on text than, yep. than do yeah exactly which is also the case for like voting too they're seeing a lot, a lot oh, more, yeah. you know obviously yeah and all that has really advanced in the last few years. I mean, yep. you know, just doing that, the mobile apps and all that stuff, and it's, that's gotten so much smoother and easier to do than it used to be. Exactly. Um, Although it's funny. All, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and, and now that um, even, even Twitter, Twitter use was sort of the last social media holdout for me that, that wasn't um, doing an algorithm for your feed right and now they are and you can switch back to the see latest tweets but the default is to get the algorithm Mm -hmm. and um that's it it just means like you you might build your audience somewhere and then they're they're not going to know about it because you've given all of your um asset over to another company (laughs) essentially and who knows whether they're going to continue to let that work for you Facebook in particular I mean we all complain about that but I was just I just did a little test to see like can I actually if I was going to pay to, to have a post to have everyone see it how much would that cost it would, and and it would cost it would cost at least a thousand dollars to get half of them I think wow <laughs> and I'm not sure that they that I can even do it for all like fifty four thousand or whatever yeah um that's not that's not feasible. <laughs> no, and and it's nothing that we haven't known for a long time. I mean, I no, that, ever since the the Dresden Double Date, yeah, yeah. Well, and like you know, I it's it's not hard to illuminate that to younger people. It's like, what if you built your career on MySpace, and then they're like, oh yeah, right. Um, yeah. So, okay, what you're saying about the texting is funny and interesting because it also shows you how nothing has changed because um, Amanda and I tried to do that, you know, like over 10 years ago before like Uh platforms existed. We would just put a Google voice number on like a piece of cardboard and like hold it up on stage. Yeah, no, I actually, I remember remember that happening. I remember there was a number and... And somebody was getting them on their phone, and it was kind of annoying. And <laughs> <laughs> yes. And now there's nice platforms to do that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I use a textable. Oh, nice. Okay, I'll check that out. I've been using Textedly. Yes, I'm sure they're like all identical. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Talking about sustainable, I'm in this for the long game, mm-hmm. and that um, I want my career to last my entire life, and so 
whatever is happening right now, right this second, I really just don't care about it yeah. unless it inter- unless it interests me artistically. That's great. I, I think um, both ways are are really good and really important. The issue that I've been seeing is people not talking about it at all. Yeah, I, I think that's it's it's like. Um, Maybe maybe it's similar to any kind of salary discussion. I think people right. have difficulties. They have they have difficulty talking about money. It's it's a it's a cultural problem, <laughs> um, and the only way to do it is just to get through the uncomfortableness and to bring it up. Somebody's got to bring it up. I find that it is in some musical situations. It's the last thing that's brought up. Mm-hmm. You have like this. You have a whole day of rapport, and then at the end, you're like, oh, by the way, it's like no one's okay. <laughs> right. um, it's. It's going to be awkward until somebody makes the first move, and yeah. if and it's always going to be better for you if, you, if that's you. <laughs> yep. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Everything so, you're saying is right. That the one thing I'm suggesting that I just that did, did not happen on a few projects I walked in, like in the middle of, is you know, it's like have that coffee or or email is fine too. Where I you know I recommend like. Just tell everyone it's, you know, usually I'm, I'm dealing with the artist who's also the songwriter and it's like, you need to tell everyone if they feel like they wrote on something, they have to bring it up in the moment or as soon as the session ends, not six months okay. later out of the oh, blue because they mean. assumed something yeah. and then it's a total disaster. Yeah. Th- this is a thing where it really, it, there are some things you can figure out as you go along, but it's really really, really valuable to know in advance the legal ins and outs of arranging versus writing versus remixing, um, what those are considered in, in the world of um, song splits and what have you. That's right. Um, and it's really just important to educate yourself about it so that then when you're working, you can be thinking like, oh, actually, I'm writing. Yes. No, I'm not just arranging. Um, and because I don't, I certainly didn't know that when I started out, and I think a lot of people still don't. Um, and uh, I did actually have a few situations in the film scoring business, actually, where I had I was being hired by different well-known composers in the world of Hollywood, in Hollywood, actually, mm-hmm. to um, do what one of them called cellification. <laughs> nice. Which was I would come down with my looping rig. And I would improvise to the scene, and they would record it, and then it would make it into the movie. Um, that was composing, <laughs> right? Absolutely. But I was, but I was only being paid as a session player. Yeah. And uh, and once I realized that, then I started um, saying, well, you know, if I'm going to do this, then I'll need to be credited, you know, blah blah. Mm-hmm. Um. But I didn't, you know, I didn't know the difference at the time. I just thought, oh, I'm just being a session cellist. But actually, I was going in there and I was writing material. So, and you're right, it's, it's really, you can't do it afterwards. No. <laughs> you can't go later and go to the person, go to the producer and be like, you know that movie that I did a session on a year ago? I actually wrote that thing. <laughs> can you go back and add my name to the credits? This is and actually, while we're at it, can I get, can I... Can I get back in royalties too? Oh, I, I do have one. This may be slightly related. I do have something I ask for now, which you know, I did with Amanda, which was um, whenever I do something that is like a major thing, I I actually have like featuring Zoe Keating in the song nice. title because because it, it's a really... The former information architect in me finds that very alarming data-wise because you're mixing up different kinds of data in a title. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, in the way that music metadata works, that's the only way that you can often be searched. Right. But that, you know, that's, that's like, that's my other one ask right now. <laughs> <I do>. Right. <laughs> it's like, if I'm going to work with you, then you have to give me a future credit. Exactly. Very smart. I did create for this book, um, a revenue stream, uh, spreadsheet that I'm just sharing mm-hmm. with everyone. Um, so if that's helpful, that that was kind well, of the point of that, so people could project what yeah. they make monthly, well, what they make annually, so it can feel like a real job in a good way. It definitely well, is fair. simple because yeah. everyone I meet who's not you is missing, you know, <laughs> some of those simple ones. I have a chapter called Repeat and Grow, which is basically like, okay, I just, you know, we just taught everyone all this stuff. Now you have to do it again. 
um, when you have a new release or a new creation? Is that something you consciously do or is that a natural evolution from one creation to the next for you? Um, every time I release something new, I look at the landscape and see what things are, what's happening and see Smart. what I need to change or do differently and it's different each time. Um, so I would say that it was different last year and it's definitely going to be different from my next release too. Um, and uh, I think it's a real mistake to do the same thing over and over again. But do, you know, you have to, you can't also expect that just because you sold something before, you can sell it again. That's right. Um, and uh, it's absolutely not, it's not a given that we all know with the, you know, the attention cycle we have now, that it, um, people need to have a reason <laughs> to, to connect with you. <laughs> You have to give them a reason. Um, so um, hopefully, hopefully, you're, hopefully, you have a relationship with a where they need to connect with you. Um, that is definitely, it's definitely a plan that needs to be made.